Yes, everybody, and welcome back to Tar Heel Illustrated. Dot com. I'm Jacob Turner. He's Andrew Jones and AJ. We're here for another edition of the Tar Heel Illustrated podcast. And we got some, I guess we could say breaking news to cover in here. I know this podcast is coming out a little bit later than when this news actually broke um, early on Wednesday afternoon. But for those who clicked on the video, you already know kind of what's happened by now more than likely. But just to to let everybody know and, and fill some people in on it, Carolina announced early today that, that Mac Brown and UNC defensive coordinator Gene Chizik have agreed to part ways. So Chizik no longer the defensive coordinator at North Carolina. Tim Cross, the defensive line coach, is also out. And uh, defensive analyst Ted Monacino is taking over his Roll one more housekeeping note too. AJ is they put out a whole statement, a lot of little factors in there. But co-defensive coordinator Charlton Warren will also remain on the staff as the assistant head coach for defense and will oversee the defensive back. And then also put out a statement saying the national search will begin immediately, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, AJ, because I know you have some maybe some different theories about what may be going on behind the scenes right now. But let's just start with kind of immediate reactions. We've been talking about this off camera a lot. I know we've talked about, you know, these two coaches in particular and just the lack of development and production on the defense over the last two years in particular, a lot on, on these podcasts. So I don't think this news necessarily comes as a surprise, but what were your kind of initial reactions to hearing this news coming out of Chapel Hill? <laughs> Yeah, I've been asked by quite a few people the last week and a half what was going to happen. And I'd said every time I think Chiswick and Cross are gone. Mm-hmm. And I figured that the, it would be I was I was interested in what the wording would ultimately be with Chiswick, because if you remember, we got him after practice a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. and he was asked if he deserved to be back by some of the media, if he deserved to be back for another year. And he said, it's a fair question. And then went and articulated why. And I asked him if he preferred to be back, if he wanted to be back. And he said, yes. So that told me, okay, there's going to be some haggling. It's not a deal where it's already been determined he's leaving and he's going to just announce he's retiring or anything like, or something like that. That told me that there was going to have to maybe be a little bit of haggling after the season. There's going to be some serious discussions. It wasn't a um, a, uh, foregone conclusion. And that's apparently what happened when the way they worded it, they've agreed to part ways. So that's UNC saying that Mac wasn't happy. Mac thought a change needed to be made. And that's Gene ultimately agreeing. So the terminology is not fired. The terminology is not retired. So that leaves it open-ended that if someone else wants to hire Gene, maybe he'll still coach. Who knows? I mean, he's 62. He looks 52. And I'm sure that there are a lot of programs out there that would take him in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. And I say that it, it wasn't always awful this year. It's just the way the things played out over the course of the year. Um, they they improved in some areas. They improved a lot in a couple of areas. Maybe that wasn't entirely Chiswick. Maybe that was Ted Monachino, which is why perhaps he was hired. But I, I think the important thing here is that it happened – Kind of had a good idea it was going to happen. I was curious when. Didn't need it coming out <clears throat> right after I got back from Pittsburgh and fell asleep because <laughs> I didn't sleep all night. Well, you knew it was going to happen flight. like that, AJ. Come on, man. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I knew it was going to happen because I texted you and Kevin mm. as I was getting into bed at 9 a.m. saying, if something major happens, call me and let it keep ringing until I wake up because I really didn't sleep at all last night. No, yeah, no. So yeah. I left the arena at Pittsburgh at like 145. Uber couldn't find me. You, you know, the usual. Oh, yeah, I know the drill. I know how that goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, it's like Uber drivers in every town I go to have no idea where the basketball arena or the football stadium are. They're no <laughs> clue. And it's fantastic. Anyway, it's it is fantastic. <laughs> and I tried. I, and so and I didn't really sleep. I didn't have time to sleep because I had got to the airport at 430. My point is that, of course, it happens like that. Yeah, it was always going to happen doing, like that. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this a little bit later because I did have to get two hours of sleep. So <laughs> it was just a matter of when mm-hmm. uh, I, I, you and I, you and I did a podcast the other day. And you asked me, why has it happened yet? And I said, or I think you were asking me last night if, if we mm-hmm. did the three things, everything runs together now. And I said, you know, maybe they're waiting to get people in place 
for recruiting purposes because they're still looking at defensive players in the portal. They offered a defensive lineman from Colorado State several days ago. So maybe that's part of it. Uh, I, I didn't know. I didn't know when they were going to pop with it, but I knew it was – I had. I didn't can't say I knew. I had a really mm-hmm. good idea it was going to happen, and also with Tim Cross. So it's done. Uh, they don't have a defensive coordinator yet right now, at least publicly. They, have, they haven't announced it. They have a defensive line coach, a new one. Tim mm-hmm. Cross was the only one for Mac Part 2, and his best defensive line was his first defensive line with uh, uh, Jason Strobridge and and uh, Aaron Crawford, who yeah. were holdovers from the Fedora era. Mm-hmm. So, in fact, a lot of their best linemen on both sides mm-hmm. of the ball were holdovers from the Fedora era, let's be honest. Yeah, you're right. They haven't done a they haven't done a great job of developing linemen in Mac Part Two. Now I think they're going to have a chance to. We can get into Montekino a little bit later, but this is no surprise. I think it had to happen. I'm not a proponent of people in the media saying assistant coaches should be fired, and I say that, and I'll repeat for other brothers who have heard this before. Just bear with me. We don't know <clears throat> all the inner workings in a program. We don't know. When they sit in that conference room, who above the coordinator, for example, Mac is saying, no, we're going to do things this way. You know, we're going to, we're going to have two guys in four technique, not just not one, you know, whatever. I'm just throwing stuff out there. And the coordinator does what the head coach says. So we don't know exactly how much is on the assistant coach. We do know everything is on the head coach. So I am a proponent. If it comes to a certain point where you say, look, man, this isn't working. Maybe they need to make a change of head coach never with assistant coaches. And so I never said that with Gene, but it appeared that that was the direction that they needed to go. Mm-hmm. It really did. And and I know you, I'll toss it back over to you here in a second, but I do have a couple of stats I want to throw out there supporting this decision. And it's not just a reactionary thing that fans have when they see the defense give up a 75 yard touchdown, the first play of a bowl game, Ah, he's got to go. There's more more to it than just that. Let's we'll talk about the stats in a second. Before we do that, I want to talk about Tim Cross a little bit more before we dive into the defensive of the whole, and then we'll again we'll 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 go into to um Monachino taking over his role in a second as well. But Cross is an interesting one because Cross is a guy that came in. You know, the, he's been here since the very beginning of the Mac Brown era. I mean, you'll probably remember that video Carolina put out on social media, like the first week or two after Mac was here with Tim Cross kind of getting everybody hyped up, all the players and everything. And I remember hearing last year, there was a lot of rumblings because of, again, you mentioned it, best D-line he's had was kind of his first year here and hasn't been a ton of development down there. Hasn't You haven't seen that group production-wise, you know, get better over the last few years in particular. So there was a lot of r- rumors last year and murmurs that maybe it's time for him to go now. And that didn't end up happening for a couple number of different reasons that we've discussed before on this podcast. And again, if you want to reiterate those, feel free, but I don't think we really need to rehash why he ended up one of the major reasons he ended up staying last year. And then, you know, again, we talked about how the defense started better this year through six games. The whole team was pretty good through six games. And then it fell apart and the defense fell apart. The D lines stopped producing it, it was just a kind of whole cluster of things. And then Tim, Tim Cross ends up leaving and, 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 you know, being relieved of his duties earlier today. So the cross one to me is interesting though, because I, I don't want to say he, it felt, I'll say this. I think from a fan's perspective, it felt like the lot of him wanted him to go last year. And I always said that it kind of felt to me like he might be on borrowed time a little bit like, okay, it's kind of not, maybe not a gamble to keep him around for another year because of the lack of production. But man, if, if this D line doesn't drastically improve and produce consistently this season, uh, there's really no way you can keep a, keep him around again. Cause he's been here so long and we just haven't seen the production on the defensive line that, that Carolina needs to, to be successful as a defense. And that ultimately comes in on him. And then you talk about Montekino coming in and kind of being an analyst and helping him out in that position a little bit. So with the cross situation, what do you make of that one? Cause we spent a lot of time talking about Chiswick, but again, yeah. cross is a guy that for, I, I'm going to, I'm going to throw out the word borrowed time. It just felt to me like this year was like, unless something drastically yeah. changes here, I don't know if it really makes sense to keep him around for another year. And then, you know, in hindsight, it's 2020. We didn't really see much change. Did we? I had a conversation, <clears throat> excuse me, in San Diego last year, right after the bowl game with someone very much in the know in the program. 
And I was told that there would be uh, a, a backlash if they would have gotten rid of Tim Cross at that time because the kids loved him so much and they didn't want to lose five or six kids to the portal. And, you know, there was some conversations that you really have to perform. There has to be a considerable uptick this coming season. That was imparted on the cross. He understood that. I guess since you and I have done a few animal house reference, say that cross was on double secret probation, (laughs) except he knew about it. Mm. So that's kind of where things stood. The line did get better. How much of that was attributed to Ted Monachino coming in as an analyst, being an NFL guy as a pass rush specialist. How much of that was just the guys that were older. Miles Murphy was healthy this year. He wasn't healthy in 2022. Kevin Hester was a year more into football. Des Evans performed at a higher level this year. Uh, they got Tamari Fox back. He did well. Bo Atkinson improved and showed some real flashes. So I do think that there was an overall improvement up front, but was it enough? No, because if you listen to Max words and as political as Mac can be, sometimes he really lays it out there. And when two of us in the media talked to him in Charlotte, gosh, when was that a week ago? Yeah, it was last time. <laughs> yeah, it was a week. Yeah, it was, it was last, last Wednesday. Yeah. Well, right? It was last Tuesday was during last Tuesday. The, the, it was the media day. God, the, these stuff oh, okay. runs together, man. Last week. It was last, it was last <laughs> Tuesday, the media day for the bowl game. And we were talking to him about this stuff. And he pointed out that how, how do you melt down in the fourth quarter against Georgia Tech like that? Melt down against Duke and survive. Melted down against Virginia in the fourth quarter. How do you do that? And he basically said, and and I'm not putting words in his mouth, but this is the way I read it. They would have been a 10-win team, an 11-win team, if the defense, as you've said before, was just average. Yeah. And it wasn't average. So if you go back and look at the – and this is Cross and Chiswick. I think that that they were both kind of – you know, helping each other get through the stormy sea by the time November hit. Because when Miami came to town, even after Miami left, they were both in great shape. Mm -hmm. The defense when Miami arrived was 35th in the nation. And here's the stat I want to read. And I'm going going to link Cross and Chiswick, obviously, to this. Through the third quarter of the Miami game, Caroline had played nine second half quarters against power five teams. Now I know that might sound jumbled. So this is just a statistic solely based on the second half of games, nine second half quarters, South Carolina, Minnesota, Pittsburgh, Syracuse, the third quarter against Miami, which was their best defensive quarter of the season. They were giving up an average of 1.4 points a quarter. In the 11 second half quarters against Power 5 teams since, they gave up 9.5 points a quarter. That's 38 points a game. That's it. It's not good enough, is it? That's what it comes down to. Yeah. And it wasn't pick sixes or anything like that affecting the stats because defensive stats, right? It wasn't anything like this. It was raw, give it up. Mm Mm-hmm. They had 121st of the nation at first downs allowed. That's not getting it done up front. You watch that game, that, Miami, or that Michigan-Alabama game? You got locked in, eye hey. discipline, and pre-snap. You've got sideline to sideline. You've got ferocity. You've got guys who stand up the runner and two others come over and bring them down. How often did you see that in North Carolina? You saw it in the South Carolina game. About it. You saw it in the Syracuse game. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you, you saw it at times against uh, against Pitt. Mm-hmm. You saw it at times against Minnesota, but then it disappeared. Mm-hmm. So things went the wrong way, and and, and it's a combination of Chiswick, his scheme, um, a guy who likes the blitz but didn't blitz a lot because he didn't trust the blitz. And mm-hmm. honestly, their blitzes weren't effective. You go look at PFF; their blitzes were really ineffective. So there was something in the disguise, something in the scheme. 
It wasn't just the kids. It was something that the other team saw in pre-snap and they adjusted to, or they saw in film and they just knew how to attack and they attacked it. So Mm -hmm. as far as cross goes, he was on double secret probation. Didn't pan out. I was told that if there wasn't dramatic improvement, he'd be gone. That's what I was told in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So Ted Monachino comes in and Mac tells us last January that Ted Monachino, one of his jobs would be to coach Tim cross. So there was an improvement in uh, sacks. There was an improvement in TFLs. They were a little bit better defending the run on first down and their red zone defense wasn't horrible, but it's the aggregate. So they improved in some areas, but it wasn't enough. You you really need to be in the top 40 and be pretty high in all the areas. You don't want to be, let's say great in run defense and awful in pass defense. Mm -hmm. And then it average out to 40. You don't want that. That's not good. You need to be pretty good in everything because it makes it more difficult for opponents to scheme against you. And they just weren't that. They weren't that up front. I'm going on forever here, and I apologize, but you think about the way how guys have not improved. Miles Murphy has not improved a whole lot. Uh, Kevin Hester has improved a lot, but he also was a basketball player until his senior year in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, Travis Shaw. I mean, a lot of this is on the kids, too. Yeah, of course. But, yeah. I mean, Travis doesn't look any, doesn't appear as a player any different than right now than the minute he showed up. Mm-hmm. So maybe a change will help that. Uh, mm-hmm. Des Evans dropped off this year. He's a near five star kid who's been in the program four years now and kind of wondering where the light is to go on with him more consistently. He's improved, but he should be an NFL player and he's not right now. Miles Murphy should be an NFL player. He's going into the draft, but maybe he'll get into an NFL camp and they'll work with him. He'll be that guy. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw that happen with Jalen Dalton. Jalen Dalton didn't look like an NFL player at Carolina. He became one. So they have got, they they have a lot of that. So both changes had to be made. I think the program needs some life. It needs some vitality. Um, even if Mac thought that enough things trended in the right direction defensively that I need to give Gene a third year, he had to make a change, Jacob, just for the sake of making a change. He had to because the fan base, uh, the fan base pay the bills. They're the one, if, if without people showing up and going to Keenan Stadium and buying the merch, Mac Brown's making $75,000 a year co- in coaching high school football and teaching health class. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a fact. Yeah. So, so the fans are very important here. And he acknowledged last week that he talks to six or 10 noteworthy boosters. You have to now. He was criticized for that. But guys, in the world of NIL, you got to do that. Oh, God, do you ever. If they're paying the bucks, man, they're like part owners now. You got to do it. I sure. get it. But you know what? So are all the people getting crazy on you on, on Twitter during the game, the people that they asked to buy this kid's shirt and that kid's shirt, buy this cup, buy this gear, go use your 20% off coupon, Jimmy seafood, things like that. And the fans are invested now more than ever before. They're also louder than ever before. Mm -hmm. And I think it was important to make a change for the sake of making a change. Mm -hmm. Now, I also think a good change was made at least one of them. I think Monaquino is absolutely uh, an upgrade if you look at his his track record and and he's a different guy than cross i think maybe you know, cross could yell at him but joke with him monaquino haven't been around him a couple of times I, I just don't see him joking that much kind of a part of my expression kind of a hard ass but i think Sometimes that's what they need that. right now <laughs> i think the program need the program needs that it yeah. needs more of that yeah they don't need any friends they don't need to hire any friends of the players you need to hire hard asses that, that get after them. Yeah, and that, that want to bring winning back to, you know, that want a no-nonsense kind of approach because, again, it just – I know the players love cross, and that's great, and that's always a positive, but it hasn't led to production. It hasn't led to better performances on the field, so I, I don't really know what importance that really plays in the grand scheme of things. But talking about, real quickly, with Monaquino – moving over to, to that defensive line coach position. I, I agree with you. I think it's a good hire. I've talked to some, I've been going back and forth with some people on Twitter because the, it, I was a little surprised at, 
I'm not going to say fans were, it's weird. Like fans were happy that they got fired, but some were confused as to why Monikino was taken or was kept around. And for me, I think people also kind of maybe don't understand what Monikino was actually able to do last year. And I know there's some weird rules with it. And do they actually get followed? I don't know. But the fact of the matter, he was an analyst. He was not the defensive line coach like Tim Cross was. So I found it a little bit interesting. The fans were like, why are you keeping Monikino around? The defensive line sucked last year and he was here. And it's like, I don't think it's that black and white. And I don't think it really works like that. So for me, Monikino makes a ton of sense. You look at his CV, you look at his NFL experience. I think that's a big draw for recruits. And I think what he's done as a defensive guy and as a defensive you know, lineman coach at the college and pro level is, is a positive and a good thing. And I think he brings that experience to the program that, you know, maybe it was lacking under cross. Cause I think cross has a good CV, but he does not have the CV that Monaquino has. So again, will it work? It remains to be seen, but I just want to touch on that Monaquino um, appointment a little bit more because yeah, I just think there's a bit of a disconnect between what he was actually able to do last year and what fans kind of understand of that. I don't think they really get it fully. Yeah. E- e- emotional thinking can be cloudy, which means you don't fully see everything as it is. And that's okay. Fans are emotional. I think that's great. Yeah. That's part of being a fan. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. But Monaquino was hired as a pass rush specialist. So his input was mainly in the pass rush aspect because that was atrocious before they, they improved, they dramatically improved their sack numbers. They dramatically improve their quarterback hurries and their pressures. And also it's even things that aren't really registered in a stat on a stat sheet at PFF or wherever the times that they force quarterbacks to leave the pocket and move. And, and when you do that, it disrupts the route, even though the routes are being run as they are, the quarterback then sees the route differently than how it's drawn up. They did a good job with that this year compared to the year before there was a significant uptick there. Mm-hmm. So what you so what you have with Monaquino is a guy, like I said a few minutes ago, he was brought in to coach Tim Cross, and by I guess uh, by association coach the kids. I have no idea how much, if any, conversation Monaquino has with the kids on the practice field or in the film room. They're not supposed to have any. It's one of the dumbest rules the NCAA <laughs> yeah, of no many. Yeah. There's a damn laundry list of stupid rules the NCAA has. This is one of them. When he was, when he and Clyde Christensen were hired, the expectation last year was the middle of April, the NCAA would pass something allowing your analysts on the field to coach the kids. It didn't happen for some stupid reason. I mean, why do you sit back and say, nah, let's, let's mm-hmm. not allow this, even though it's in the best interest of everybody, right? It's NCAA but, for you right there. Exactly. So it's going to be up for a vote here pretty soon, here in January. And if they get it, what, what's interesting to me is they can go out and hire another defensive analyst and a defensive coordinator. So really, Mac has two hires to make on the defensive side, and he'll do both. And uh, it'll be very, very interesting to see who the analyst is. I, I have a – I believe that the defensive coordinator situation might already be taken care of. Mm-hmm. Right now, it just hasn't been announced. And maybe the analyst job has to, or you get the coordinator in, you get the analyst at some point. They don't need to have an analyst just yet, though it helps. Clyde Christensen played a key role in Max Johnson uh, going to Carolina. There were a lot of parts that were connected between Carolina and, and the Johnson family, which brought him to Chapel Hill. There's going to be some. There are guy, a lot of guys in the portal, man. Mm-hmm. Dudes are hitting the portal. My phone, I, I have the portal alert. It literally goes off every 45 seconds. No, I believe it. There are a lot of offensive players out there. Maybe you do bring in an analyst and you tell a kid, look, you got Monaquino up front. Here's your new defensive coordinator. And here's your analyst. Like, wow, mm-hmm. that's pretty impressive. And maybe that's one of the reasons they have not gained commitments yet from more kids, especially on the defensive side of the ball because of that. So, Monaquino is the real deal. Look at some of the guys that he's coached in the NFL and how he's helped them. Look at what NFL people say about him. Now he's responsible for the whole defensive line. That's a significant upgrade, a significant upgrade. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great move Mm -hmm. and we'll find out who the coordinator is and the coordinator will be in concert with Monaquino and 
And I guess one of the other things that people are wondering, why would you make this move and not let the new coordinator pick whoever's on his side yeah. of the ball? Cause, cause yeah. Warren also got a promotion. I believe the coordinator's already been determined. Mm-hmm. I think they already know who it's going to be. You don't want to be so disrespectful to Gene and hire someone tonight and announce it. Maybe in a couple of days, national search. They've had plenty of time to do their own search. They've had plenty of Mac knows every phone number in the business. Mm-hmm. He probably knew for a while this was going to happen. Uh, he had to have the conversation with Gene, but I'm sure he knew this was probably going to happen. He has names. He calls those names. They have conversations. You make a decision. So mm-hmm. y- you don't put Monaquino in that job. You don't promote Warren. You don't keep everybody else and say, and then go hire a defensive coordinator and tell them, but you can't bring any of your people. You have to coach our people. Whoever would take that job had to have already agreed on it, in my opinion, or they wouldn't have made those moves. Mm-hmm. So I guess it'll be, hopefully it'll be announced soon because I really don't like coordinator coaching searches. They are not fun. Brutal. Brutal. They are they are filled with misinformation yeah. out there. Mm-hmm. So we'll do the best we can on it, but I think it's going to happen pretty quickly because mm-hmm. I think it's already been decided. Yeah, no, I'm, I agree with you. I think when you look at it, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was the kind of second thing from a fan base perspective on Twitter that I've seen is, well, why are you not allowing the defensive coordinator to, to come in and hire his own people and – the more we talked about it pre-recording, you kind of brought up that that angle of looking at it. And I was like, yeah, because for me, I was responding saying, well, I, I get keeping Monacino around. I don't have any issue with that. I, I think when you again, we look at his CV, what he's done I, to me, it makes a ton of sense. Plus, he's been there for a year, knows what needs to be fixed. And now it has the you know, he's the guy now. So he has the ability to put his hands over everything and fix that. But when you look at it from the other perspective, too, of, well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really make sense to hire a defensive coordinator and not let him hire his own guys. It ha- For me, I agree. I think it had to be predetermined. I think Carolina probably has its guys selected already. So hopefully, maybe by the end of the week, it'll be announced. If Carolina has found that guy, then I don't well, really know let, what necessarily what the holdup would be. You know what I mean? Let me throw this in there, too, to support this position because Monacino was a one-year guy. Yeah. There, there, was no, there were no bones about it, made about it. He was there one year and he was off. And I actually was kind of surprised he was still there for the bowl game. <laughs> I remember seeing him. We were over at practice after practice to do some interviews. I remember seeing him. And I was like, Monaquino's still here. <laughs> I, mean, I figured he'd be glossing there because he wanted to get back in the NFL. Mm-hmm. When we talked to him uh, not long after he was hired, he said he wanted to get back to the NFL. When I've talked to people in the program, over the last year, I was told he wanted to get back to the NFL. So the question, in fact, I asked Mac in a press conference sometime in November if Clyde Christensen was going to be back. I didn't bother asking about Monaquino because the clear understanding was that he was going to go back to the NFL. He, mm-hmm. wanted, he wanted to be in the NFL. He enjoyed the analyst role, but he wanted to get back to coaching guys in the NFL. And um, so I didn't ask him about Monaquino. So I think Monaquino, knowing he would get hired in the NFL, had to know who his boss would be on that side of the ball in order to accept this job with NFL openings about ready to explode here in a week and not pursue an NFL job. So to me, that's more credence to the idea that they've already determined who the coordinator is going to be. They're just going to allow a little period in between before announcing it. Yeah, and it's he, good to get a guy like Monaquino had to know has to know who he's going to work for. Yeah, yeah, of course. Has especially, to know. yeah, especially when you talk about what he said earlier in the year, and, and it makes sense too. You got to get someone in quicker too. I mean, recruiting purposes, all that kind of jazz. You, you know, transfer portal nowadays. You need to have your staff identified if you're going to go out and try to get these guys that Carolina ultimately needs to get um, in the portal, the especially. Class, so, yeah. classes start the tenth. I know. Classes start in a week. This is week away, yeah. Wednesday, right? Yeah. Yeah, week away. Classes start next Wednesday. The early enrollees report Sunday. Mm-hmm. Got to rock, man. Yeah, got to get it rolling. Yeah. No, I think. Yeah, I, I think we're going to see bang, bang, bang here. I agree. I agree. And hopefully from a media perspective, we do see a little bit of a bang, bang, because <laughs> nobody wants to sit around and speculate who they're going to hire for six weeks. We don't have any time for that. No, guy. especially we're trying to, we're trying to focus on basketball again. season, Mac. Come on, man. 
<laughs> well, especially because I got to travel again. This crap always happens when it's around travel. Oh, of course. Of course. There is no off season in college. Although football. the traveling this weekend will be easy. Just drive down yeah. to Clemson, but still it's a noon game too. So that'll, mm-hmm. that means from the time I wake up Saturday morning till like eight o'clock at night, I'll be ensconced in all things Hubert Davis. Yeah. I believe it. I believe it. I want to bring up last thing, AJ, and then we'll wrap it up. You said earlier my thing that I always keep saying, been saying it for I don't even know how long, you know, 18 months now probably. Carolina's an above average defense away from from being a 10 win football team every year. I was talking to a fan a couple of days ago and he brought up something. It kind of it kind of rebuffed me a little bit. It was like, no, nah, I think they're yeah, I think I agree with that. But he's like, I think they're an above average defensive line away from being a 10 win football team. And I sat there and I thought about it and I said, Heck, I mean, you might be right about that. It all starts up front, AJ. And again, I think Carolina showed some nice things earlier in the year. But the fact of the matter is the defensive line for me, and even the offensive line to an extent, because the trenches are such an important part of football. You brought it up too earlier, watching those Michigan-Alabama game, watching the Texas-Washington game, and watching how those defenses perform. Now, I know there is a big gap between North Carolina and Michigan right now. But that's ultimately what Carolina wants to get to, is being a top program in the country. I think if that D line was just producing, getting more pressure on the quarterback on a consistent basis, stopping the run on a consistent basis, just being an above average unit. I think the defeat, the whole de- entire defense, especially when you look at a lot of the individuals they have back there in those specific position groups would benefit tremendously for it. So I just wanted to throw that in there too, because yeah. uh, it, it's an interesting, pre- it made me kind of sit there and think like, I can kind of see an argument for that. So you get that defensive line. Figured that out that does the make the, but, but yeah. that's part of the defense. So of course, yeah, it all goes kind of, it, it, it's like, a, yeah. Look, football is all about trenches. I don't mm-hmm. care if you run the West Coast offense, the triple option, the power eye, the air raid, whatever it is, you have to win your battles up front, no matter what your scheme is. No matter what all the school guys are doing, the big uglies up front got to win those battles. On the other side of the ball, I don't care if you're in a 3 3 5, a 4 2 5, if you're in the old Oklahoma 44 defense or anything like that. You've got to win your battles up front, period. Mm-hmm. If you if you occupy blockers, if, if you have a, a if you have two linemen up front that occupy multiple blockers, what does that do to the blitz? Mm-hmm. You don't have to do it as much. It yeah. makes it easier to get to ha- create blitz lanes to get to the quarterback to pressure. If you can get conventional pressure up front, which is what Mac has talked about a lot, you don't have to blitz. You don't have to rush more than three guys you get to drop your linebackers back in coverage you protect that middle area the pass defense a little bit better and if you have a conventional pass rush with corners who can cover and you could go a little bit more man on the corner well there you go the the the, the, the line of scrimmage has a trickle effect on both sides of the ball to everything else mm-hmm. there's a reason left tackles are paid as much as they are but the other linemen are paid a lot too. Defensive linemen are paid a ton of money. If you if you are a, a middle guard, like a nose guard, which has been basically a term for a long time, and you occupy two blockers every snap, it's 11 on 11, but the quarterbacks don't block. So it's really 11 on 10. If you've got a lineman occupying two blockers every snap, it's 11 on nine. Mm. And the guy with the ball is not blocking himself for himself. So it's really 11 on eight find the ball. Mm-hmm. So those numbers, it's a strict math thing. It doesn't take, you don't even have to know anything about football to understand what I just said there. So it absolutely begins up front. And that will be Ted Monachino's job is to get those dudes up front to occupy more blockers. They don't have to rack up a ton of stats, occupy blockers, have gap control, do things that allow schemes on defense to work more. Mm-hmm. allow your coordinator to be more creative with when he comes with the blitz instead of making it more predictable. So that's the thing that, that, that a good defensive line does. It allows you to be less predictable and allows you to play more in base. So when you're in base longer and having success, when you do something that's not in base, the, the offense isn't as prepared for it. They have to be far more reactionary and it's not as much the preparation because they don't know when it's coming. Mm-hmm. So it, it's like a team of basketball. If you're really good at track, like Carolina this year has had a lot of success pressing full court, but they don't do it very often. And that's what makes it so good mm-hmm. because it can catch you on a couple possessions 
sort of shake the foundation some and then draw back, drop back, right? That's what you want some of your scheming on defense to do. Mm -hmm. If you could play in base and the, and the defensive line allows you to play in base, you can play in base and stay in base and have a lot of success as much as possible. That's optimal. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It, it, it's interesting. There's so many different things. We can sit here and talk about it for another hour, honestly. But again, here to discuss the news about Gene Chizik uh, parting ways with, with North Carolina. And again, Tim Cross out as a defensive line coach as well. So offseason shakeups, AJ. I think we we all kind of expected it. Nothing again, like we talked about, I don't think anybody was necessarily surprised by it. I think ultimately it had to happen. But uh, yeah, still a, a lot of moving parts with this situation. So make sure you keep it locked to, to TarHillIllustrated.com. As soon as you know the new guys hired or announced, whenever that happens, it'll it will be reported over there. So again, keep it locked at TarHillIllustrated.com. And, and AJ, as we always say, come join our premium message board. Just eight thirty three a month. I know you'll more than likely be putting some insider information if this it does end up being a longer drawn out process about who may get hired, but regardless, there'll be any tidbits you have about that situation will go on our premium message boards as well. So great time to, to come join over there, especially off season of football. So interesting. And then you got basketball in full swing right now. Recruiting never stops. So it's a great time to, to come get involved. Link portal, is in the description portal. below portal. There's, yeah, man. There's going to be more portal activity and we got a lot of portal stuff on the boards. Yeah. Portal just never ends until it ends put it that way if that makes sense <laughs> that is 365 days a year it feels like even though it's not yeah, tomorrow is going to be a portal day for me because we yeah. we have hubert on friday and then i got to go mm. to clemson got a little so bit of tomorrow's a tomorrow's day. gonna be a big well it's not quiet it's it's low key yeah. it's not quiet until uh, you know, tomorrow big big portal day yeah, hopefully five other things don't happen tomorrow for you, AJ. But uh, you never know. That's the nature of the business right here. So, again, keep it locked to, to TarHillIllustrated.com for all your coverage of Carolina football, basketball, and recruiting. But, AJ, let's go ahead and wrap this thing up, man. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones, another edition of the THI Podcast. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. Hit that notification bell, too, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Thanks.